Welcome to CPSC 526, Slix 26, Lecture 2 on Cryptography, or literally, Secret Writing. Cryptography is the art of sending messages so that no one else can read them. Typically, when we think of it, we imagine two characters, Alice and Bob, A and B. Alice is talking to Bob over some insecure channel. So they're sending messages to each other, but there is no way they can be certain that other people aren't able to also look at this channel, monitor this channel, and so forth. And Alice could be a web browser, and Bob could be a web server. This would be a, an example of where you might want to have some security, where you might want to have some confidentiality, where you might want to prevent people from tampering with your messages. Right? They could be people who are having a conversation but as well something more familiar like a, a web browser going to a website. And with these two characters, there's a third one called Eve, denoted with E, the letter E. And Eve is an eavesdropper, and they're trying to read data that's being sent or modify data that's being sent or inject data or delete data. Sometimes you'll see the concept of Eve being only a passive attacker. If you recall the previous lecture, we introduced passive versus active attacks. A passive attack doesn't involve changing the transcript of communication that would have otherwise occurred. And so Eve can be sometimes considered a passive eavesdropper, only reading, and then another character, Mallory M for malicious, is the one who's actually doing these active attacks, modifying data, injecting data, deleting data. For the purposes of this course, we'll just stick with Eve. Eve is the general attacker, and the Eve character will can be restrained to only passive attacks or be allowed to do active attacks as well. So Eve is an eavesdropper, why we call it Eve, and they're trying to read data, modify data, inject data, and delete data. Again, we touched on this before, Eve would therefore be our adversary, and if we're talking theoretically, or be our attacker, if we're speaking in terms of systems. If Eve only reads data, then Eve is called a passive adversary, and if Eve can further inject, modify, delete data, it is called an active adversary. Another dimension is information theoretic power versus computationally bounded power. The idea here is that if Eve has access to an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of memory, we would call it an information theoretic adversary, meaning that there's no bound to the amount of computational power at Eve's disposal. However, for most practical security that we actually use anywhere, we make computational assumptions. We use tipped or tricks in cryptography that are based on the hardness of some computational puzzles or computational problems or mathematical problems, such that the only way to, for instance, decrypt your traffic is to try every single key, for example. Now, if there's a billion different keys, then you can try a billion different times and one of them will work if you know that there's only a billion different keys. Now, in the case of cryptography that we actually use, we're using 2 to the 128 or 2 to the 256, which are enormous numbers, more than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So an enormous number of possible keys you can try, with the goal being that if the only way you can break the system is to try every key, you'll run out of time before the heat death of the universe, before you're able to actually try all the possible keys. And this is forming the basis of the security, therefore. But if Eve doesn't have this limitation, it's called an information theoretic attacker, meaning that the security relies on not being able to do some computation fast enough, for example. In practice, there are limits to computing power. There are You can have a finite amount of time, a finite amount of memory, and therefore it makes sense that Eve would actually be computationally bounded. And so a computationally bounded one just simply means a, 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 an attacker who is limited to what is physically possible in terms of computation. Now, barring some innovation in computation, it may be possible that things that we consider hard today are not, future, are not hard in the future. And a quantum computer is indeed an example of such a thing that would render obsolete many primitive basic cryptographic assumptions. 
But nevertheless, a computationally bounded adversary means that with our understanding of today's computers and in the near future's computers, that Eve is not able to do the attack that would effectively try every single key to break the cryptographic system. <clears throat> in a, a technical sense, when we say there's a finite bound to Eve's computational abilities, what this means is that it can be simulated by a Turing machine with a bound on its execution time. So the behavior of Eve, if we model Eve as an algorithm, then it would be implementable as a Turing machine. And then we would say that a finite computational bound means that Eve has some limit to the number of steps, for example, that the Turing machine can do before we say that Eve can actually achieve this in practice. And typically it's some polynomial function based on, on the input size. So communication threat modeling. What exactly is the threat that we're worried about? We have Alice and Bob, they're communicating. Eve controls the communication channel. For instance, Eve is tapping the lines of communication. Or for instance, the lines run through Eve. Maybe Eve is the cable company, or Eve is some government agency through which a lot of internet traffic is routed. So it could be the case that Eve comes and actually adds a listener device on the wire that Alice and Bob are using to communicate, or Eve is actually part of the infrastructure that delivers messages between Alice and Bob. Cryptography is the approach to achieve security despite this limitation that Alice and Bob are communicating in the presence of an attacker, Eve. We use encryption to hide the contents of messages, thereby achieving confidentiality. And we have similar cryptographic techniques that allow us to sign messages digitally that shows that they weren't tampered with. In this sense, Alice can send Bob a message and sign it so that Bob knows that Alice was the one who provided that message. The actual message is called the plain text, and the encrypted message is called the cipher text. Now, cryptography has a quite long and rich history, particularly as it relates to politics and warfare. There's been a variety of different cryptographic systems that have been developed through time, through history. So we'll do a brief summary of some of them, the, the history of ciphers. We have first the Caesar cipher, the Caesar cipher is a simple alphabetic shift. The idea here being, for instance, the encryption of the letter A is, for instance, the letter D, where then the key would be the number three. So every letter you get, you add three, you increase its position in the alphabet by three positions. So A becomes D, and B becomes E, and C becomes F, and so forth. And to decrypt it, you simply subtract that number from it. So to encrypt a word, you add, you increment, for instance, if you had your key three, you would then increase the position of every single letter by three to encrypt it and decrease it by three to decrypt it. And it's mod 26 because there's 26 letters. So once you reach the Z, you wrap around and, and start with A again. Now, a problem with this is that it is trivially breakable because if we have a system where every time you see a particular letter, it maps to a particular other letter, we can use techniques known as frequency analysis. In a normally written English word, you'll find that E is the most common letter. And so if you, in a particular word, this may not work, but if you're looking at a, an entire paragraph or a sequence of sentences, the frequency of the different letters will jump out at you. And in the context of computer communications, it's the same thing. It might not be the letter E, but you're going to have messages. For instance, HTTP GET will be the beginning of a message. You'll have some higher level information that allows you to know what particular parts of the message are. And in so doing, are able to figure out what they map to. And once you have that key, the number three, for example, if the key was adding three to each letter, then you're able to decrypt the entire message. But even without this frequency analysis, there's not actually that much more work to do because ultimately there's only 25 different keys that you need to try. There's only 25 different keys because if the, you were adding zero to the letter, it would look the exact same and your job would be done. But otherwise you just check, 
if I decrypt with one, does it look like an English message? If, what about two or three or so forth? And eventually, if this is the strategy by which the cryptography was being done, you would find the corresponding key to decrypt the ciphertext and turn it into its corresponding plain text. So consider this mess of letters here. We can just try going through all possible rotations of alphabet symbols, increasing them one by one until we get something that's readable and then we can conclude and figure that that was the key. Another approach is a letter substitution cipher. Now this is better than the simple shift where every letter shifts by three. Now in a sense we're permuting the alphabet. We could say that A is the letter R, B is the letter D. We can pick, we just shuffle the alphabet. We take the string of the alphabet, we randomize it, and whatever position the A used to be in is now shifts to that particular letter that appears in that position. So if the result of permuting the alphabet has the letter R as the first letter and the letter D as the second letter, then every time we see an A, we replace it with R. Every time we see a B, we replace it with D and so forth. However, frequency analysis will still thwart this approach. We find the most common letter, that's going to be E. The next most common letter is either going to be T or A. And once we start having vowels, and letters and some consonants put together, we're able to start piecing together out the words and ultimately can figure out what the messages are actually saying. Now, on the other hand, despite the frequency analysis working to thwart this approach, it is the case that there are far more encryption keys to try. Whereas for the first one, we had only 25 possible keys. Here we have far more keys. And I encourage you to remember what that would be. And the answer after you pause and have a moment to reflect is 26 factorial is the number of possible arrangements of the alphabet. And 26 factorial is a much larger number. It's much more in the realm of something that we would consider trying every single possibility, no longer something that could be easily done. Nevertheless, this approach can work for very small amounts of text. For instance, the word RTGJA, this really could just be any four-letter word. Absence any other information any other words that are encrypted with the same key, it's truly the case that it could be the word east or the word west or any four-letter word except for particular ones, except for particular kinds of four-letter words. So what property would the word have to have for RTJA to be a valid encryption of it given the fact that we're using this this particular cipher. And so I'll again, encourage you to pause and give that a moment's thought and move on to the answer. It is the case that every letter can only have appeared once. So for instance, if we had T, G, and an S, this could be jolly or wheel, right? The N, N means that this whatever letter, we don't know what that letter is. It could be the letter L, it could be the letter E. We don't know what N is encrypting the ciphertext for, but we know wherever we see an N, it's going to be the same letter, whatever that letter happens to be. So RTJA can be any four-letter word such that there is no repeating letters and... If there were repeating letters in the ciphertext, they would correspond to repeating letters in the plain text. There's an important in notion of encryption as well that you'll run into at some points in your career, I'm sure. It's called ROT13. This is just a fixed key variant of Caesar cipher. It's basically you add 13. So the letter A becomes the letter N. ROT13 um, is, again, not useful if you're actually trying to encrypt information so that it can't be read, because, of course, the Caesar cipher is insecure, and in this particular one, there is a fixed key, so it's even less secure, but it can be useful to, for instance, hide a spoiler for something in a message so that you're not broadcasting out the answer, but anyone can go and, and copy the text and run it through ROT13 and get the answer, get the spoiler. So what is special about this encryption? Again, I encourage you to take a pause and reflect. What is, why 13? Why not 12? Why not 20? And the answer is 
Because there's 26 letters in the alphabet, what's interesting about ROT13 is that its decryption function is the same as its encryption function. Because decrypting a ROT13 encrypted message is the same as re-encrypting it again with ROT13. So you don't need to subtract 13 because adding 13 twice, mod 26, is the same as adding 0. Next, we have the Visionaire cipher. This is also known as le chiffre indichiffrable, and it's basically just a repeated version of the Caesar cipher. So this was military-grade encryption in Napoleon's time. It was widely used for hundreds and hundreds of years until the 1800s when it was broken by cryptanalytic thought. However, before then, it was actually regarded as a great way to encrypt data. It wasn't as trivial to break as the Caesar cipher. And the way it worked was, instead of adding a single, instead of adding, for instance, three to every single letter, it would take a word, such as in this case, the word Banff, and just repeat it over and over and over and over and over. And then as you're encrypting a message, it matters what position, what letter you are in, because the first position gets encrypted with a B. So say it was an A, and you combine it with B, you get C. And the second position gets encrypted with the letter A, and the third with the letter N, and so forth. So it's not that you're adding, for instance, three to every single position, but in all of the positions in, of 1, 6, 11, and so forth get some key added to them, but all the positions 2, 7, 12 get a different one added to them, and so forth. And now, the only thing you have to remember is what this magic word is. What's the word that is being added to every single letter to encrypt the message? So, how does this get bro break broken? What, what was the flaw with the Vigenaire cipher? And the answer to that is that ultimately it is still just a repeated Caesar cipher. So if, for instance, the word, let's say you knew that the word was five letters long, then you know that each individual, each letter at position one, six, eleven, and so forth, is going to be encrypted the same way. So now instead of solving Caesar cipher once, you simply need to solve it five times. And you can combine all of the letters at the positions mod, residue 1 mod 5 together, do frequency analysis, figure out the key, what's the most common letter, that one corresponds to E, figure out what the key is. Then take 2, 7, 12, all the residue 2 mod 5, and do again the same thing. What's the most common letter? That letter is E. All right. Figured, then you figured out the second letter in this magic keyword. Now the key here is that you need to somehow know how long this word is, that it is, for instance, five letters long. What if you didn't know that? Then of course you wouldn't. There's no regulation that it's going to be five letters long. It could be any arbitrary word. Well, the answer here is that you can simply just try and figure it out. You can guess. You first can guess, is it a one-letter word? You look at the distribution of all of the ciphertext. Does it match the English language frequency analysis that you would expect? If not, guess that it's length two. Divide all the letters into even and odd buckets and do look at the frequency of the different letters. Do they match what you expect to see from natural language, some English text, the frequency you would expect to see. If not, you try three, and then you try four, and then you try five. And when you try five, if five was in fact the length of the word, you would then see the frequency jump out at you. So for the other cases, the frequency would look more or less even, and when you guess the right length of the word, the frequency would jump out and suddenly make a lot of sense. Again, for short messages, this, this Vigenaire cipher can work. In fact, it's even more secure than the substitution cipher because if your key happens to be the same length as the word, then truly you can create any single word at all. If your word of that you're using to encrypt a message, the Vigenaire key, ha happens to have the same length as the actual word that you're trying to encrypt, then you'll be able to create for every single possible word a valid key you could have used to decrypt it. 
There's some different word that you can add for every four-letter word to take you to any other particular four-letter word. So the question now is, how is this happening? How does this encryption reveal no information? How is the encryption RTJA allow us, if we have a four-letter word to encrypt it with, allow us to effectively reveal absolutely no information about what the decrypted word is, what the corresponding plain text is? Well, it turns out that the reason that this is possible is when you have the same number of possible keys as you do possible messages. The idea being here that if you have some ciphertext C and an encryption key that takes you to uh, some message M, another encryption key could take you to another message M prime, and similarly for every other possible message that this could decrypt to, there's going to be a key that will take you there. If you have this property, then you can build a system that is information theoretically secure, meaning that if you don't know anything about the key, then you don't know anything about the message. Because the notion of trying every single key until you get the right one won't, doesn't apply here. There'll be one key that takes you to one message, another key to another message, and every single possible message, there will be some key that will decrypt, in a sense, the ciphertext to that particular message. Meaning that all possible messages are therefore a candidate for the output, you know, provided that they have the same size as the ciphertext. So this notion of perfect encryption, or information theoretically secure encryption, means that given the data, you just simply learn nothing about it. So we're going to talk about how this is implemented. Just before we do, we briefly review the XOR operation, the exclusive OR. The idea of XOR is that uh, it's, it's either one thing is true or the other thing is true, but not both. That's why it's exclusive OR. So this or that is true only when this is true or that is true, but not both. So zero XOR or zero is equal to zero. The, there's a few notations for XOR. Um, frequently a circle with a plus inside of it is the one that's used. On a programming languages like C++ and, and Java, Python uses the caret, so shift six on a standard keyboard. Zero XOR one is one because one of the operands is true, one XOR zero is true, and one XOR one is false because both are true, so the result is false. So XOR has some interesting properties. One is that the XOR of itself, uh, of a operand X, XOR to itself is always going to be zero no matter what X is. If you XOR zero to anything, you just get that thing, so nothing changes. If you XOR one, you get the negation of it. It has the nice properties where x, x or y, x or z is the same as x, x or y, x or z, same way that addition commutes. And it's symmetric in that x, x or y is the same as y, x or x. It doesn't matter which order the operators appear in. And you can extend this then to a bit by bit XOR operation. So you have bit strings or binary strings let's say it's n bits long, so we have to have the same length, but x1, x2, dot, 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 xn as a binary string, x ordered with y1, y2, dot, 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 yn, is equal to the first bit of x and y x ordered together, followed by the, the resulting bit of this of x2, x or y2, x3, x or y3, dot, 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 all the way to n. So it's just every single bit. You can take two strings and XOR them together, and you end up with a bitwise XOR of those two strings. And similarly, you can XOR characters, letters. So, for instance, in, in ASCII encoding or UTF-8, the the number, the the position for the letter B, lowercase b, is 98, and for the letter H is 104. So you can actually XOR B and H together. This would be, in a sense, how you might actually encrypt something. Right? You have two characters, and you're doing a bitwise XOR of them. So B, the letter B in binary, we just convert 98 to binary, and we get this string. For H, we convert 104 to binary, and we get that string. And now we can actually see what the bitwise XOR result is. B XOR H is simply 10. Because all the positions where they're both 0 stay 0, all the positions where they're both 1 become 0, 
and it's only when one but not the other has a one in that position that there's a one in the resulting XOR. So the letter B XORed with the letter H in this case is the new line character, backslash N, if we are using a ASCII encoding. So with this, we can actually build a, an encryption system, which is called the one-time pad. The one-time pad encryption works by taking a message M and XORing it with the key K. So the encryption of a message, E sub K, so we encrypt a message M with the key K, it's simply the message XORed with the K. So K is a string, a binary string, of the same length of M, and we just take it to be random. So it's a random string. This key is a random string of the same length as M. And as you can see, this results in the encryption of a message and every possible message of, length, of the same length is eligible to be the thing that gets reached. Because for any binary string that we want to say have as our ciphertext, given a particular message, there will be a key that will take us there. It's simply, if we decided ahead of time, this is what we want our ciphertext to be, the key that we would need to get there is mxor.ciphertext c. The decryption operation works by, again, XORing it with that key k. So the decryption is you, the same as the encryption. So it's just like ROT13 that we talked about. It, the encryption and decryption operations are the same. Now we can see the identity. So the decryption of K of the encryption with K of a message M is equal to the decryption with K of M X or K. That's just the encryption function, which is M X or K X or K. And by the properties we've already discussed, this is the same as M X or K X or K. And when something's XOR to itself, we just get a zero binary string the, they cancel. So if you take a, some string and you XOR it with itself, those will cancel, so in this sense we can just remove them and we're left with just the message M. So this is the sort of proof of soundness that the decryption of the encryption of a message is equal to the message. If this is the case, then we have a, a working encryption system. If this isn't the case, then we don't have an a working encryption system. And the key here is that the number of possible keys and the number of possible messages and the number of possible ciphertexts are all the same, or in this case as well, the lengths are also the same. So the length of the key, the length of the message, and the length of the ciphertext, they're all the same length, and we can have this nice one-time pad operation. So we're taking a message M, we have a random pad that we're padding it with, this is our key K, the result is a ciphertext. To decrypt it, we XOR it again with the same key, the same pad, removes the, cipher, removes the confounding part and leaves us just with that message. And again, for any possible message, there's going to be some key that we can XOR the ciphertext with to give us that message. And it will be exactly the message that we want to see XORed with the ciphertext. That will be the key that takes us to that message. And, and another message also similarly has a key for the same reason. So the one-time pad is an example of perfect security. Frequency analysis can't help decode it, or no frequency analysis can decode it, so it's not vulnerable to any of these things. It's not vulnerable to trying every single key. We can't just try, even if we had infinite amount of time, we still couldn't just try every key because the result is one of the, one of the keys will be the correct key, but we can't tell it apart from another key that will just give us a different message. We can't tell apart what's the correct key. There's a key for every plain text ciphertext combination, and so you can therefore never prove that it's the correct deciphering. So then why don't we all use one-time pads? They seem pretty good. Information theoretic security properties, excellent um, robustness against all these sorts of attacks. Why are we using you know, less secure things? Well, the answer is that some people do, in fact, use one-time pads. And um, diplomats or spies would have uh, books and books and books of one-time padding material that they would have before they would go into um, uh, to do any field operations. And then when they receive a message, they can sync up with their pad and decipher it this way. And, and this is the you know, for very important secrets, this is a, 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 you know, a bit tedious, a bit of work, but it's a very possible thing to do. And here on the right, you see the actual um, 
encryption and decryption function depending on what your key letter is. So if you have the letter J, you can then, and you have the, and you, you're looking, your ciphertext is a B, it decrypts to a P. So this, this table is, is basically, it's not doing exactly an XOR operation, but instead doing a cyclic shift over the alphabet. And this is just giving you the helper on how to do it. On the left, we actually have the randomness itself, the actual random key padding material. Um, this is a red phone. This is actually not what is meant by a red phone. So the actual red phone was not red. This is just a movie prop. But if you're familiar with the Washington Moscow hotline, which was a phone network that was used during the Cold War so that the U.S. and Moscow could have secure communications to discuss things that may go wrong with the bomb, for example, this was being done using actual uh, one-time pad. So here's actually how it would have been implemented with a teletypewriter. It was one-time pad material. So briefcases and briefcases filled with one-time pads were exchanged by diplomats so that Washington and Moscow could have a communication line that was information theoretically secure against anyone who might be listening, where they could discuss anything urgent that may be necessary to discuss. There's also um, shortwave radio stations that are called number stations, and these are actually quite interesting. Um, no country really claims to be running any, except lots of them exist, and there's plenty that have existed, certainly more during the Cold War. And basically, they just broadcast out numbers. You can listen to some recordings of them online, and it's very eerie. They just like speak out some numbers, and the idea that is widely held is that this corresponds to messages being sent to spies in the field because shortwave works over an enormous distance. So you could actually listen for these numbers and with your one-time padding material, decrypt the message, actually get uh, the message that was being sent. So in this case, a single message is being delivered to a single spy by using a broadcast being sent all over the planet uh, that everyone can listen to, but of course only the person with that encryption key is able to turn that into a meaningful message. So the main reason we all don't use one-time padding, one-time pad encryption systems, is because it's not very usable for day-to-day -day needs. We have to manage a lot of this padding material, we have to generate a huge amount of it, we have to secure the delivery of it, we have to exchange it ahead of time. So if we want to, say, do a, a web search and we're using encryption to do our web search, we'd have to ahead of time somehow exchange all of this amount of one-time padding material with Google or whoever might be using it. They have to keep track of it all. It's logistically quite challenging. You always need to have more padding material ahead of time than, than for what you need because, of course, if you run out, you 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 can't create any more. You have to exchange the padding material at a time when you're secure, when you have a secure, authentic communication channel between two entities. Later, when you when you're sending messages and there might be an attacker, then you can only use the padding material that you've already exchanged. You can't use one-time pad material to send more one-time pad material because, well, I mean, technically you could, but it wouldn't benefit you. You would use one kilobyte, for instance, of padding material to send a new kilobyte of padding material. The result is you have one kilobyte of padding material. You also have to make sure that the pad is never used twice. It's called a one-time pad. If it gets used twice, it is vulnerable to security attacks. And second, you need to make sure that the pad is randomly generated. Ideally, something like a coin flip, a coin toss, or something like that, where it's not, there's no bias. Because, of course, if the one-time pad material was generated such that there was some non-trivial amount of bias in, in it, then the result is that some statistical information is then leaked. It's no longer information theoretically secure. Every single bit has to be truly random for this to actually work. So why is it called a one-time pad? The problem, if we use a, the same pad twice, say we have ciphertext 1, which is M1, XOR with the pad P, ciphertext 2, which is M2, XOR with the same pad P. So here, we've accidentally used the same pad twice. Well, now the attacker can XOR C1 and C2 together, and the result would be M1, XOR P, XOR M2, XOR P. And because of the properties of XOR, it's the same as M1 XOR M2 XOR P XOR P, and P XOR P is zero, so it's just M1 XOR M2. Now, 
Note that this is not immediately actionable. It's not, you have two messages and you've XORed them together. You're not necessarily going to be able to tease these two messages apart, but we have lost our information theoretic guarantees. There is now frequency analysis, right? The most common letter in both M1 and M2 is going to be the result of E and E working together. That would be the, the most frequent pairing of letters because of the distribution of letters in English. But second, if you happen to know some non-trivial stretch of M1 or M2, because of, there's words that are typically used, um, or phrases that is typically used, so for instance, maybe you search for the word confidential somewhere, or top secret, or things you would expect. For instance, if you were doing an HTTP request, you would have things like your user agent string and the version HTTP 1.1 and so forth. The, you can search for stretches of string that you are assuming are going to be present in M1, and if you are correct, you can try it at every single position, and if you're correct, M2 will reveal itself, right? And M2 will reveal itself to be some word that makes sense. And then you can go back and forth like this. If you have the part, first half of a sentence, you can start guessing what would the next words be and see if when you, when you, de when you XOR it into the other string, do you get something meaningful there or do you just get random, randomness that makes no sense? And both M1 and M2 would look like things that would be said, things that are being intentionally said, so there's going to be some structure, and so if you can guess some of it, you can see it be, it gets decrypted automatically if you're right in your guess. So how do you make sure that a one-time pad is randomly generated? Well, there are some good sources you can take for randomness. A, the sort of, the best one to use is some sort of physical phenomena. So rolling a dice or flipping a coin, these these are the best ways to do randomness. If you were to, for instance, generate an encryption key for something extremely important, like uh, what a major bank uses as one of its core encryption keys for doing something very crucial, you're going to want to generate it by flipping a coin, not by running a script on a computer that hopes, hopefully generates a random random number, but maybe it makes a mistake every now and then, or maybe it, uh, there's a bug in the code. In this case, if you're generating a secret for something very important, you're going to want to do it with this sort of physical phenomena. And radioactive decay is another example of this. You can't predict it, but there is some structure to it, so you can count the whether or not the uh, the next piece of radioactive material that is uh, left the left a particular material, whether it occurs sooner than expected or later than expected, and then that's a zero or a one. You can use uh, human interface devices, human input devices as a source of randomness. So this is how, when you're doing things on a computer and generating randomness, there's a pool of randomness, and this is fed by things like network traffic or mouse movements or keystrokes. These are good sources of randomness because now there's actually a human involved doing something. So there is going to be whatever randomness the human provides by virtue of interacting with a computer in a non-prescribed um, uh, or non-predictable way, you can extract randomness out of this. And then, yeah, device interrupts or networking events, things that aren't going to be the same every single time you run a computer program, but are actually somehow depend on the, the world outside. So these are good sources of randomness. Now there's two types of randomness when it relate, as it relates to security. First is true randomness, and this includes randomness from all these good sources that we just talked about. The idea here is that it is unpredictable from all information that may come or may be revealed. So this is randomness that's secure against an information theoretic attacker. The idea here is it's independent. So when you flip a coin, every single time you flip a coin, it's a new test, a new experiment, and you're getting a result. These are independent events. And so a randomness that comes from flipping a coin a thousand times, this is true randomness. It doesn't matter what information the attacker has, they'll never be able to guess what the next bit will be, if, especially if you haven't even flipped it yet. 
You could the attacker could know every single bit of randomness that you've ever generated with this way, and they would still have absolutely no idea what your next bit will be. This is true randomness. The second is called pseudo randomness. These are random numbers that look random. So when you when you look at the zeros and ones, they you know they have the flavor of randomness, but they might fail some statistical tests, meaning that there may be some structure to them that is knowable with the right information. Given a particular fact, you could start predicting them. And this means that they're not generated independently. So how can they generate? The way that they work is with a pseudo-random number generator, a PRNG. This generates a stream of pseudo-randomness using a seed and an algorithm. And if you've ever used functions like RAND, the system call RAND, or, or the, the, rather the libc call RAND, and srand to seed it, if you've ever generated random numbers in this way, then this will be familiar to you. You are not generating... Your computer isn't generating random numbers based on a coin flip. It's generating it based on some algorithm. And uh, the most common one is this linear congruence. Basically, it's taking a number and multiplying it by a huge number and then doing a modulo reduction. And then the res residue is the next random number and it does it over and over and over. But if with enough of samples of numbers generated this way, you can just start predicting them. They're not actually random. So they're good for certain cases, like you're just needing some random numbers for a simulation, but they're not good if you're trying to generate random numbers for encryption keys. So there are two types of pseudorandom numbers, cryptographically suitable and not cryptographically suitable. So going back, we have true randomness, which would be useful for this would be cryptographically suitable if you could if you wanted to generate an encryption key say for your one time pad you could do coin flips to generate it and this would be a good source of randomness the attacker will never know what that is but you could also generate it with pseudo randomness using a seed and an algorithm so given this if the attacker can look at the stream of random numbers and f start figuring out what the next ones are then it is no longer, then it is not cryptographically suitable. And if they can't, then it would be cryptographically suitable. It means you could actually use it for an encryption key or something like that. Now, crucially, this no longer has this property of information theoretic security. Because once you know that your stream of random numbers is based on a seed and an algorithm, and the seed is, say, a fixed size, so you start with a 128-bit seed or something like that, and there's only some amount of algorithms that would be used to generate this, the attacker could just try all the seeds and all the pseudo-random number generators and start seeing, does it generate the sequence that they see? And the idea here, again, being going back to this notion of brute force search, as long as there's lots and lots and lots of possible seeds, more than the adversary can try, then you can get cryptographically suitable randomness, as long as the attacker can't start guessing what the next bytes of this random sequence would be without this seed. So cryptographic suitability is a requirement on the algorithm, a pseudo-random number generating algorithm, that a computationally bounded adversary cannot predict the next bit at any point in the stream, knowing the entirety of the stream before, better than just guessing. Now, if we were to do true randomness, coin flips, we know that this holds, right? If, we're, if our randomness is based on coin flips, the adversary cannot predict better than just guessing. They can know every bit of that we've ever generated, but guessing the next one is truly a guess. It happened whenever we flip the coin, that's what will happen. But a pseudo-random number generator, if the adversary can look at the entire stream of numbers that have been generated, there will be a next bit that is known. The computer that will run, the algorithm that runs, that will generate the next bit, that's been preordained. There's no, there's no uh, in a sense, surprise available. The next bit is either a zero if the algorithm produces a zero, or a one if it produces a one. 
And whatever it produces is already known at the time when it was seeded, when the algorithm was initially seeded. But an adversary who doesn't know the seed and can look at the entire stream and still can't guess the next bit, we say then this is a cryptographically suitable source of randomness. And again, this reduces now to a computationally bounded adversary because a computationally unbounded one could just try every possible seed and one of them will be the correct one. And there's only going to be a finite number of seeds assuming that the seed is of a fixed length. So, cryptographically suitable randomness, this therefore requires that the stream of randomness cannot reveal the seed. If it reveals the seed, if you can guess the seed just by looking at it, then you can trivially reconstruct the entire stream and thereby compute the next bit. Now again, as long as you compute the next bit, that's fine. So you don't actually have to know the seed in order to start computing the next bit. It's a way of doing it. If you can look at the stream, guess the seed, you'll be able to produce the next bit. But you don't need to do it that way. Just by looking at the stream, if you can produce the next bit, then we would say that it is not cryptographically suitable. So functions like RAND, not cryptographically suitable. They're based on these linear congruence generators where you can start, just by looking at the outputs, you can start figuring out what the, the next bits will be. If the seed is predictable, then the stream is also predictable, which means that if you generate your random numbers by, say, taking the current time and using that as the seed, which is often the case when you're, when you're just uh, random using a random seed, when you're seeding a random number generator, you use the time, because the time is a good source of, arbitrary, of an arbitrary unguessable number that we can use to bootstrap a random sequence. But the attacker also knows the time. So using the time as the seed is fine, again, if you want random numbers for some simulation, but not if you want random numbers for cryptographic purposes. And importantly, you can have a, a, an excellent cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator, but if you give it a predictable seed, it's useless. And it's not the algorithm's fault. The algorithm is secure, only it was misused. It was not correctly used because the seed has to be random. The best way to generate randomness for such a thing like this is to go back to true randomness. So you take true randomness, coin flips or uh, human interface device interrupts, stuff like that. You use that as your source of randomness to seed. Use true randomness to seed a pseudo random number generator. And then you have an ability to create an infinitely long sequence of random numbers, even if the human isn't interacting with the computer fast enough to generate as much randomness as you need. So what needs randomness? If you're using random numbers for cryptographic purposes, they need to be unpredictable. So one-time pads, public keys, We'll, we'll talk about public key cryptography shortly. Session keys, which are the keys that you use just to encrypt communications. Random tokens. This is in the context of web security. Web cookies as well. There's lots of uses for these random numbers. And much of day-to-day -day internet security actually relies on these numbers being random. And we're going to come back to this many times throughout this course. There will be many times where we talk about where random numbers are actually used for which particular uh, protocol. So if these concepts don't mean anything to you just yet, don't worry, we're going to return and discuss them all in depth later on. If you're using random numbers for something extremely important, use coin flips. This would be things like long live signing keys for certificate authorities or banks. And again, if that doesn't mean anything to you, it will later on when we talk about certificate authorities. When using random numbers for other purposes, they really only need to be uniformly distributed. So there's other concepts in security where we just need a random number, but it doesn't need to be unguessable. It just needs to cover the space of possible numbers more or less evenly. And so these are things like salts, challenges, nonces, initialization vectors, identifiers. And again, we'll, we'll talk about all of that, these concepts as well the time when they come. But the idea is that there are some 
things that we need unguessable randomness, and there's other times that we need just some random number that won't accidentally get used two times, won't accidentally get used twice. We just need to have a random number each time. In this case, it doesn't matter if the adversary can guess it. What matters is that it is not ever going to repeat or something like that. And one, uh, a, a, a nice property you should keep in mind when designing such a system is despite a random number not needing to be cryptographically unguessable, if there's no harm, you might as well be cryptographically suitable. You should, in this case, just always use cryptographically secure randomness unless there's some reason not to because this makes it easier to have secure systems. Because if you have a non-cryptographically secure random number generator that you use for only for these purposes of non-cryptographically secure needs, but some other programmer comes along and just reuses this function thinking that it's a random number generator, now you might have a violation of this assumption. And if all of your randomness is just cryptographically secure by default, then this gives you a safe default. It is more usable. Because now, even if you, if you don't need cryptographic security, well, you haven't really lost anything. And if you do need it, there's no risk that of someone screwing up and using the wrong random number generator. Where can you find randomness? So on a Unix-based system, there's two main devices, slash dev slash random slash dev slash u random. So slash dev slash random is based on true randomness. And this is this notion of an entry P pool where things like mouse clicks and keyboard clicks and uh, network uh, interrupts and stuff like that, they get put into this pool and as a result form a... Uh, the ability to read it out from this pool. So when you need randomness, you open this device. So it's it looks like a file, and this is the Unix philosophy, but it's actually a program. So when you open it and read, instead of actually reading a file, it's actually running a program. And that program extracts randomness from the randomness pool and returns it. And if you want to cat this file, so just uh, have it printing out to the console, you can cat slash dev slash random, and it will just print all of the randomness it has and stop because the pool isn't that big. But you'll notice that if you start moving the mouse around and clicking or something like that, you, you will see randomness start appearing. You'll see randomness because it's actually taking your interactions with it and um, producing randomness from that. Slash dev slash u random, on the other hand, uses a cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator to generate randomness. So, it uses a seed based on slash dev slash random to seed a cryptographically secure random number generator. And so if you cat slash dev slash u random, it'll just print nonstop. It'll just continue printing. There's no entropy pool that empties out and then you have to move the mouse around for it to read some more. It'll just print and print and print because it's generating this randomness algorithmically. Right? And this is great for many uses, but there are caveats. Right? It is not for information theoretic uses, so you should know your adversary. Higher level programming languages will also have generators random, and these may be based off these devices, but it's not sure exactly how they work, and so you'll have to read the documentation. So if you're writing in a programming language like Python, and you just import random, not going to be cryptographically secure. You're going to have to use the cryptographically suitable one. And it would be the same with any other language. But if you're writing a program that can access these device drivers, you can just always open up slash dev slash random, read 16 bytes, take that as an encryption key, or open slash dev slash u random and get cryptographically suitable pseudo randomness instead. What about a bad source of randomness? Well, this is anything that can be predicted. And this is true even if it starts as a good source. So you can have a good source of randomness to begin with, but if you misuse it, end up creating ultimately a bad source of randomness. So for example, 
This book, which makes excellent bedtime reading, is a million random digits. It is exactly like it's described. And the thing is, while this book would have been excellent, because the numbers here are actually good random numbers, now that they're published and known to the attacker, then it's no longer going to be good to base your encryption based on, on these. If Eve can predict the next random bit that Alice chooses even slightly better than random guess, then it is a bad source of randomness. We want Eve's ability to guess the next bit to be 50-50. Any difference, any advantage that Eve has versus just purely random guess represents a lack of cryptographically secure randomness. Okay, the next topic we're going to cover is the basic encryption algorithms. So stream ciphers, this is the, um, one of the older ways of doing encryption for computers. The idea of a stream cipher is that it is effectively one-time pads in practice. So again, we have this one-time pad, we have this problem of having to generate all this randomness and share it between devices, and we have to do it all ahead of time. The idea of a stream cipher is there's a key, K, and this key is a seed for a random number generator that just generates cryptographically secure randomness. And then we, if we have a message of a thousand bits, we generate a thousand bits of randomness with this key, and then XOR our message with the random the, the randomness that was created. So it works exactly the same way as, as the one-time pad. Alice and Bob both share a key K, and Alice encrypts by generating the sequence of randomness and XORing it to the message. Bob decrypts by generating the same sequence of randomness and XORing it again to cancel it out, getting the message back. But instead of having to share all of the randomness as this one-time pad, instead, all they need to share is this key. So as long as they have the key at the start, they're able to generate a, an arbitrary amount of randomness in this way. Now, it's not cryptographically secure against information theoretic attackers because the key is of a fixed size. The attacker can brute force try them all. But it is as long as the algorithm, the cryptographic, the random number generator is cryptographically secure, then the adversary cannot predict the next bit cannot guess what the stream will be, and as long as they don't know the key, they won't be able to decrypt any of the messages. So it functions like a one-time pad. It looks like a one-time pad, but if you know the key, that's all you need to do in order to break it. Again, this key cannot be reused. You can't have Alice encrypt one message with the, the randomness of the stream and then encrypt another message with the same randomness because then we have the two-time pad problem, right? We'll have the same stream, being used twice, then the attacker can take these two messages and cancel out the, the in random stream and be left with the XOR of the two messages themselves. Uh, as mentioned, stream ciphers are no longer secure against an information theoretic attacker. The next major type of crypto uh, cryptographic primitive is known as the block cipher. So a block cipher is is the most is the standard way of doing cryptography. It used to be the main standard. The main the the main implementation was first called DES or Data Encryption Standard, and now it's been replaced with AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. And the idea is that the the message is divided up into blocks. So you have a block size of let's say 128 bit. You divide up the message into these blocks and the function encrypts each block one by one. And there might be one block at the end that's you know shorter than a full block. You just give it, uh, pad it with zeros to the end of the block. And then you go through and you encrypt all the blocks and then to decrypt them, you decrypt them. You decrypt all the blocks. So now the encryption is a function that maps a some 128-bit block to another 128-bit block. So it's, uh, the encryption is just a function that takes a key and, and turns one block into another block, and thereby encrypting it or decrypting it. So what can go wrong? 
Well, here is a block cipher that's naively being used to encrypt a picture. So here's a picture that's been encrypted. You don't know what the key is. However, it is wrong to say that the attacker can't learn nothing about this picture. This is an encrypted, the actual picture is encrypted. The problem is that the nature of these block ciphers, if the, 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 it's taking a 128-bit block and encrypting it, well, the encryption of a black square is going to be some particular thing. And every time there was a black square, it goes to the same particular thing. And the encryption of a white square in this picture would go to the same thing. So we can now see, even though we don't know what the actual decrypted value is, every time we had a white block of this bitmap, we end up with the same encrypted value. And every time we have a black part of this bitmap, we have, again, the same encrypted value. So clearly we can learn something about the plain text, even though this is an encrypted image. So what exactly happened? Each block is encrypted separately, and there's only so many different values that can appear as plain text blocks. So if we have some block value of x encrypting to y, and x appears a lot, then we'll see it y a lot in the ciphertext. And this is frequency analysis, right? Another way to think about it is if you were to encrypt a phone number digit by digit, well, the first three will be the encryption of four, encryption of zero, encryption of three, if, for instance, you knew that it was a 403 area code. So you would then learn what the encryption of four is, and if four appeared in the actual number, you would see that same encrypted value again, right? This is just frequency analysis now being applied at this level of blocks. So what is actually happening and how could we stop it? Well, the problem is that we cannot rely on simply treating each block, encrypting each block separately. Yet for unfortunate design reasons, this is the standard, or the, in a sense, the simplest way, and as a result has become sometimes a default way of doing things, even though you should never actually do it this way. So ECB mode, electronic code book mode, this is a mode of encryption for these block ciphers, and there's a few other modes we'll talk about in, in a moment, but this is the basic mode. And the idea being where each block of data has an encrypted version, so when you see a block, you look up the encrypted version, and that's the result. So ECB mode is what caused that encrypted penguin picture to be appearing the way it did. Right? Visually, the courtesy of Wikipedia, we have a plain text, we have a key, we have the block cipher, we have the cipher text. And every single block is treated separately. If the same plain text appears twice, we'll see the same cipher text twice. Right? And this is the same mechanism by which we can defeat the Caesar cipher and the, the, the other ciphers that we saw through this frequency analysis. Right? And the decryption operation is the same, except now the block cipher is de being in decryption mode. The next mode of operation, called CBC mode, cipher block chaining mode, this is the one that should be always used. So ECB mode exists because it, it makes somehow sense that this does exist technically as a concept, but to the degree that it has been sort of made to be the default mode of operation is quite unfortunate. And in fact, the default should always be CBC mode. You should know if you're not going to use CBC mode in a block cipher, you should have well-articulated reasons why you aren't using CBC mode in your block cipher. So in CBC mode, you have an initialization vector. This is a random bit string, and it gets used alongside the key. And as we talked about before, this initialization vector, it just needs to be uniform random. It doesn't need to be unpredictable. The adversary is fine to know the initialization vector. The initialization vector does not need to be secret. But the initialization vector is used to effectively randomize how the block cipher mode works. It works like this. You take your plain text, you XOR it with this initialization vector, meaning that now the first input to your block cipher could be anything, because the initialization vector has the same length as a plain text, meaning that this XOR operation functions like a one-time pad. 
Then you encrypt that, and that's your ciphertext, and then you feed, you chain the resulting ciphertext to become the initialization vector for the next block, XORing it with the plain text, getting the ciphertext, which feeds into the next block, and so forth. This is the cipher block chaining operation. And to decrypt, all you have to do is take the ciphertext, decrypt it, and then XOR out the initialization vector to get the original plain text message. And as well, you take that ciphertext and you XOR it with the resulting decryption for the next block to get its plain text and so forth. And notice that if you somehow lost the initialization vector, well, you are going to lose the first 16 bytes. But the rest of it is intact. If you had the entire ciphertext but not the initialization vector, you can look at this diagram and see that you would still be able to recover the second block and further on, but you will have lost the first block. There's another mode of operation called counter mode. This is also useful. Um, it has different applications. It, it, it's, it has ability to do random access effectively. So if you don't want to decrypt the entire block because you need to be generating these, these initial or getting the output so as to be able to decrypt it. The counter mode, in contrast, effectively works by encrypting a number and using that as a pseudo-random sequence to XOR your message. So it basically takes your block cipher and turns it into a stream cipher. The idea here is that you have a counter, counter 0, counter 1, counter 2, and you're just encrypting that number. So you encrypt 0 with the random key. The result will be a random string that you can XOR with your plain text to get ciphertext. And then you encrypt the number one, encrypt the number two, encrypt the number three. You see there's a nonce as well at the start. So the idea here is that you have some number to use only once. This is what nonce means, a number for to use once. You pick a random nonce, and then you start your counter at zero. And why this works is that, well, if you wanted to use counter mode to encrypt a message and then use it again to encrypt another message, well, you're going to restart your counter. So if you encrypted a message M starting at counter zero, and you encrypt message M prime starting at counter zero, then the encryption of M and the encryption of M prime will effectively be encrypted with the same one-time pad. That's the two-time pad problem. And so in order to be able to use the same key over and over and over, while still running this counter mode of operations, starting at counter at zero and increasing it, we use a nonce. So the nonce is just some random number that you use to effectively create a different pseudo-random number sequence as output from the block cipher. So by having a different random nonce for every single message you encrypt, you're able to then encrypt using the same key without the two-time pad problem. Interestingly, counter mode of operation, the decryption function is actually the same as encryption. Again, you take your random sequence, you encrypt 0, you encrypt 1, you encrypt 2, dot, dot, dot. You end up with a random, pseudo-random sequence, and you XOR it with the ciphertext to cancel it out and get the plain text. Right? This is the same as a one-time pad. It's the same as a stream cipher. The same general operation that the decryption is the same as the encryption. You, you simply do encryption again to cancel it out. And so if you're actually working with OpenSSL, for example, a sort of, um, I guess you could say, an, an annoying gotcha is that they don't even have a decryption function for counter mode. So you're sort of expected, I guess, to know that you are supposed to encrypt it again instead of having a pseudo function called decrypt that actually just runs encrypt. So interesting design choice. Unsure if this helps or hinders. It does force someone using this to actually, in a sense, understand why it works. But from a design perspective, every other mode of operation has encrypt function, decrypt function, and then the counter mode one is just missing. And I'm sure that it has confused many programmers through time. Okay, how do we decide if a crypto system is any good? 
if we come up with some way of doing encryption, how do we decide, is this a good crypto system? Is this a good way to do encryption? What are, what are our metrics? Well, we define an adversary. We give the adversary capabilities. And then we see if our system, our crypto system, is able to defeat this adversary. Right? And the closer that the adversary maps to the real-world attacker, the better our system will be, the more secure it will be. And the fewer restrictions that we place on the adversary, or put another way, the more abilities that we give our adversary, the better our system will be if it stays secure. Because if we define security relying on a very hindered attacker, well, we might achieve security in our minds, but in practice, if, that doesn't, if that's not the real attacker that we're going to be facing, then we actually have no security at all. The fewer restrictions we put on the adversary, the better. A strong adversary, meaning an adversary with a lot of capabilities, is a weak assumption, meaning it's easy to make that assumption. It's easy to assume that the attacker is very strong. Assuming that the adversary is weak, does not have a lot of power or capabilities, is now a strong assumption to make. That is, it's harder to make this assumption that the adversary is very weak. It's easier to make the assumption that the adversary is strong. All right, and you can achieve security by assuming that the adversary is weak, but you've only achieved it by declaring it. And if the adversary isn't actually that weak, you don't have security. So let's talk about some attacks on crypto systems. First, we have the known plain text attack, KPA. Here you have some plain text. You're trying to find its matching ciphertext. So obviously, if you can use this to figure out the key, the encryption system is vulnerable to this attack. right? And in the classical ciphers that we saw, like the Vigenaire cipher, and the Caesar cipher, this was trivially true. If you knew the plain text and the cipher text, if you just had one pair of messages, plain text, cipher text, you would just see the key. You would just be able to pull the key out right away. So you might be wondering, well, why, why are we giving out the plain text at all? Like, isn't the whole point of encryption to hide the plain text? Yes, but still, it's not entirely un out of the extraordinary that an attacker might somehow get access to the plain text and a cipher text, one possible pair, across all of the times it's ever used to send any messages. And if the system is broken such that if that happens, the entire thing is useless now, and the attacker now knows the key and can decrypt everything, then we're, we, we don't have a very good crypto system. And sometimes... The message, the plain text part, can, is just known. For instance, if you're encrypting an HTTP GET, you're going to have a bunch of fixed headers, uh, there's going to have fixed structure, it's going to be very guessable. Right? Defenders have protocols. We're not encrypting random messages, we're encrypting messages that are valid HTTP GET requests. Sometimes it can be guessed. So for instance, if you're encrypting a color, well, there's going to be not that many possible colors. So if the attacker knows that what's being encrypted is one of a dozen colors, well, then they've greatly reduced the set of possible states, the set of possible original messages, and they can just check. If, if this was red, can I pull the key out from this? Or if it's blue or something like that. So this is another case where you can end up with a known plain text. Of course, it can also just be leaked. There could be an insider who gives it to the attacker. It could be published by accident. You could encrypt something and then later on it no longer needs to be private, so you just publish that information, which, you know, this will happen, but if that results in that key being compromised for every other message that was ever encrypted with it, that's really bad, right? Or it can just be compromised some other way, the attacker breaks into the system or something like that. So, for protecting against KPA, this is a good idea. Another attack is chosen plain text attack. So here, the attacker isn't just given some arbitrary plain text and it's a corresponding encryption, they actually get to choose. So the attacker has access to a black box that will encrypt your messages using the same key. So imagine you feed it an input 
and it outputs the ciphertext, and you get to choose what it encrypts. Note that if you don't have this choice, this is the same as KPA. KPA is CPA without the cho choice. You just are given a plain text ciphertext bear. In CPA, you choose the plain text and get the ciphertext. So how can a chosen plain text attack actually happen? Well, there's cases of this actually happening in World War II, for example. So the Allied troops conspicuously planted mines in the North Sea. So basically they went, they put in mines, underwater mines, and they did it in such a way that they knew that the Germans were observing it, that they, they did it intentionally to be noticed. And then they looked to see the, what the German encryptions were then transmitting, what information was being sent out. Because now they've chosen the plaintext, right? The plaintext is the description of their mining, and the ciphertext is what the German transmissions were. And then when the Germans removed all the mines, they sent the all clear, they, they would also have known that as well. And the U.S. did something similar, saying low on supplies in Midway Island. They sent it in plain text so that it would be captured by Japanese spies. And then they looked at the transmissions being sent by the Japanese as a result, based on that. So these are cases where you effectively trick your adversary into encrypting something for you. right? So CPA can actually happen. If your system is secure against CPA, then it is secure against KPA. And the reason for this, why? Well, if your system can defeat a, a case where the attacker chooses the message, then it must also defeat the case where they just are given a message. Because they could always just choose the message that they would be arbitrarily given in that case. Right? When the adversary gets to make a choice, it means they're making the worst choice if there is a possibility for such a worse choice, right? So if the system was broken against known plaintext attack, the attacker of a CPA could just choose whatever known plaintext makes the system break. And so if you are secure against CPA, you must be secure against KPA, right? This goes back to the zero probability faults, this idea that the adversary can exhibit arbitrary behavior. In this case, if the adversary gets a choice, they're going to make the, the worst choice for you, if they can. The contrapositive of this as well, if you have a system that's insecure against KPA, it implies that it is insecure against CPA. There's another attack called the chosen ciphertext attack, CCA. This is similar to CPA, except that you get to pick the message to be decrypted. So in this case, the attacker chooses the cipher text and is given the corresponding plain text. This is also called the lunchtime attack, with the idea being that someone sneaks into using your computer while you're out at lunch, but you can't then use it later to decrypt a new message. So while you're away from your computer, someone comes and uses it to decrypt a bunch of mes messages, and then afterwards they leave. And hopefully, from what they learned, they're able to figure out the key or start decrypting further messages that haven't yet been sent to you. And also, a form of this notion of an insider threat. Another crucial property for a crypto system is that of semantic security. We say that a crypto system is semantically secure if the only thing you can feasibly learn about an encrypted message without having any information about the key, without knowing the key, is something about its length. That is, well, if you were to take a message and encrypt it, the encryption has a particular length. The most you can say is, well, this plain text, when you maximally compress it, can't be much shorter than this. That's about the only thing you can learn for a semantically secure system. Another notion in this case, it's a, not a good notion, like a, a common form of doing security before, is known as security through obscurity. And the idea here being that your system is work is secure by not revealing anything about how it works. So this was 
standard practice before to hide the algorithms, not show exactly how they work. But it turns out that security is not best achieved by hiding all the details of the implementation because someone will just be able to figure it out. Someone will be able to reverse engineer your algorithm, figure out how it works, and then break it. And if you manage to create something that you think is secure but you know isn't actually secure against all possible attacks because you just didn't think of, for instance, the attack that would break it, someone else might find that attack and thereby break it. By we achieve security for things like AES and DES. These algorithms are secure precisely because they're all public. Every detail about how they work is known so that the world's top cryptographers can actually try to break it. And the security of them is based, like for instance, AES, the security of AES is based on the assumption that, well, if the world's top cryptographers trying to break it can't, then it, it probably is secure. Now, of course, some cryptographers work in the open and would let us know if it's broken. Others don't work in the open and wouldn't let us know if it was broken. So it's not a perfect measure. And it may be the case that it is broken and some people know it. But it's better than relying on no one ever finding out how it works. And that's the only reason why this encryption system works. This is also formulated as Kirchhoff's principle. Kirchhoff's principle says that a system should be secure even when everything is known about the system except the key. That is, you're encrypting, there's some small key that changes, and as long as no one knows what the key is, the whole system works. Everything else is public. You don't need to physically protect the machines that do encryption from being tampered with, being inspected by someone. It's only the small secret key that achieves security. This is also formulated as Shannon's maxim, Claude Shannon, uh, one of the inventors of information theory. He says the enemy knows the system, right? Don't assume that this isn't true. Don't assume that you've managed to keep the system hidden from the enemy. The enemy knows the system. Can you still be secure? So security through obscurity is the opposite of Kirchhoff's principle relies on not telling anyone how it works and hoping they don't figure it out. Generally a bad idea. It fails if applied. The crypto that we use for everything has all been publicly inspected and has been unsuccessfully attempted to be broken by the world's best cryptographers. Typically, the attacks are not in crypto. The crypto we have is solid. The, the attacks that we see frequently on the in the world are attacks that bypass crypto or work despite crypto, not by breaking crypto itself. Crypto is not the weakest link. And so the crypto that we use, these are all time-tested tools. Now the NSA in the States, they're the National Security Agency, they would be an exception to this. So the NSA can, for instance, have encryption schemes that only they know how it works. They're leveraging this unpredictability where there serves no disadvantage. And the reason is, that they have more mathematicians working in the dark, not publishing their work, not talking about their research, not talking about their findings, not talking about the advances in mathematics that they are doing internally, that they may very well be ahead of the actual, by necessarily, as long as there is any innovation that they've made internally, they would have all of the insights of the public science of mathematics, plus their own silent, dark advances in mathematics as well. So in this sense that the world's top cryptographers can analyze these systems, well, in the case of the NSA, they very well have the world's top cryptographers working in the dark for them, which allows them to develop their own crypto that isn't as publicly inspected. So now that we have this encryption, the question becomes, how do we actually manage the keys? That is, if I connect to Gmail, I don't have a secret key. I don't know a secret key. I know a password, but I don't have a secret key that is only known by me and Google. There's no encryption key to start with. So what actually happens? And that will be the topic for part two of the crypto lecture.